Just a quick note to our listeners before we begin today's episode. We recorded this episode in person at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, and so the noisy, bustling traffic of Hope Street and Renfrew Street is at times audible on this recording. Hello and welcome to the Scotland Singing for Health podcast produced by Scotland Singing for Health Network. I'm Brianna Robertson Kirkland. And I'm Sophie Boyd. And today we are joined by two very special guests. Before we introduce them, let us tell you a little bit about this podcast and why we are talking to you about Singing for Health. Singing for Health groups support the management of a range of conditions, such as respiratory conditions, dementia, Parkinson's disease, and mental health concerns. In each episode of the podcast, we will be talking to singers, singing group leaders, researchers, and medical practitioners to find out more about the benefits of singing and what Singing for Health activities are taking place all around Scotland. We are coming to you in a slightly different format And that's because we received funding from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland's Innovation Studio to continue our work. The focus of this project is developing new training opportunities for Singing for Health practitioners. And we have just held a workshop with our fabulous network of practitioners at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland to help us consider what Singing for Health leaders are looking for in terms of starter training, i.e. someone with no experience of leading and singing Uh, Singing for Health group, and continuous professional development for those who are experienced and may have attended training before, but are looking to further develop their practice. Both at the workshop and in our episode today, we are joined by two amazing speakers, Anne Ritchie, who is the co-founder of the Chain Gang Sing to Breathe charity, and Nicola Weidenbach, Director of Training at Sing to Beat Parkinson's. A very warm welcome to you both. Um, Anne and Nicola, can you tell us a little bit more about your organisations and what you do? Um, So I work for Sing to Beat Parkinson's. Um, It's part of a slightly bigger charity called Canterbury Cantata. Um, But the uh, purpose of the Sing to Beat Parkinson's uh, branch the charity is to promote uh, singing for Parkinson's. Um, People with Parkinson's uh, is a neurological condition and has a lot of um, mobility issues, but 95% of people with Parkinson's will have speech issues. And singing has been found uh, to be an effective way of uh, people with Parkinson's practicing exercises in order to maintain their voice, particularly uh, kind of hoarseness or mono pitch. Um, so uh, the Sing to Beat Parkinson's uh, promotes training in particular um, in order to develop the workforce so that there are more people leading these activities. So we've been uh, working in the last kind of five or six years um, training more leaders. So we've trained about 200 people and we've now got about 30 affiliate groups. Uh, the Chain Gang uh, is, um, found, was founded by three general practice nurses in uh, 2013, called the Chain Gang because we first met in Chain Street in Edinburgh and our members felt that they were shackled by the same condition. Um, Interestingly enough, we did discover years later that there was a doctor chain in George in Edinburgh who was a respiratory physician, which I think is quite interesting. Um, Essentially, what we were looking for um, is to try and help our our members to breathe more efficiently through singing. Uh, And we um, teach them to extend the out-breath, which is one of the problems that people with long-term respiratory conditions have, is an inability to breathe out fully. And so they uh, reserve some air in their lungs, which then increases their breathlessness. Um, so we encourage them to sing out uh, in long phrases. Um, and then we also encourage them to not use the muscles of their neck, shoulders and chest wall. And so we encourage them to sing using the um, core muscles of the abdomen, which in then we'll uh, encourage the diaphragm to relax and contract um, 
in accordance with whether they're breathing in or out. Um, people with COPD, for example, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, will have quite flat diaphragms and the diaphragm doesn't work as well as it should do. So using the core muscles will encourage the diaphragm to move up and down. Wonderful. Thank you so much to you both. So you were both here today talking about the respective training that your organisations deliver. I wonder if you could give us the cliff notes version of uh, the chat that you had today with uh, the people who were in attendance. Uh, so I talked about how our training program has developed, particularly um, with the impact of the pandemic. So uh, we, before the pandemic, used to do kind of a residential two day training. Um, but we noticed that uh, people kept on returning. So they've been on it for one year and they'd come back and then a couple of, couple of years later. Um, and so it always felt just for the pandemic that the, the training model wasn't quite working because I didn't feel we were quite reaching the needs of those returners. And then obviously the pandemic occurred. So we took the training online and we found actually for the first stage, so people who were kind of new to learning about sing to beat uh, Parkinson's, uh, that works quite effectively online. And now we do residential for the returners or the people who have done the online training. Um, and that's become a far more of a sharing, uh, co collaborative uh, kind of knowledge share. Um, and so we've kind of solved our own problem via the pandemic, believe it or not. We um, discovered that just singing helps people with COPD. We discovered that very early on because we weren't doing any of the breathing exercises, breathing techniques that we had. So actually singing itself is very helpful for people with breathlessness. But what we wanted to do was encourage um, uh, breathing efficiency. And so we use specific techniques um, to, to do that, which is why it's so important to train people to, to um, encourage singers to use these specific set muscle sets um, for um, efficient breathing. And that's why we um, decided that rather than just having people singing with um, our members, we wanted to have them trained specifically to um, breathe properly. I thought it was interesting, Anne, because I did the Che Gang training mm -hmm. seven years ago. Yeah. Um, what I learned on your training was so different from the choir leading training that I'd done in terms of how you facilitate safely with this group of people. For example, uh, never bringing people in to start singing with an in-breath, mm -hmm. which would encourage everyone to <gasps> gasp in. and that was quite a lot of um, having to change the technique that I was used to implementing with singing groups. How do you start people singing without bringing them in with a breath? I think it's interesting, so talking about why training is important, instead of somebody just going into that group with training, but not specific health training, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have that knowledge. Ask it's never saying, breathe in, never asking people to hold their breath, things like that, that you would maybe do in a, in a singing warm up with a, another choir. But um, yeah, it was definitely a, a change of practice for me that I had to adapt. Yeah, and you're not the first person to say that to me, Sophie. <laughs> and it was interesting when I was watching Nicola's video this morning uh, um, <clears throat> about people with Parkinson's and there was quite a lot of movement in that video. There was a lot of raising their hands up and, and holding their hands above their head. Now, that is something we would never do with somebody with COPD. So it is, it is interesting because there are singing for health is a fantastic notion, but I do think that we have to look at specific conditions um, and make sure that we do no harm. Um, so um, it, it was interesting for me to watch, and I was thinking, because I'm going, oh, my God, they're raising their hands. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I thought, well, actually, of course they're raising their hands. I've got Parkinson's. This is great exercise for them. But for somebody who has CPD, raising their arms will, their arms will reduce their um, thoracic cavity a little bit and will cause problems for them to 
uh, get in rhythm. Well, I would, yeah. but I would like to say though, we always caveat that exercise by saying if you do have any comorbidities, uh -huh. don't do it. Uh, so we, because yeah. we are kind of aware of that, yeah. um, because other people have trained in the in the lung health. Mm -hmm. So it looks like everybody's doing it. <laughs> but I promise you, we're safe as well. Uh, that's that's well. interesting. I think because that's something uh, looking more generally at saying for health, these are all things that will, will have to be considered you know, looking specifically at things that some groups will be able to do and others will not be able to do. And and looking at that um, in a holistic way. I agree, because I think some groups are runners singing for health groups, which mm -hmm. obviously have a benefit. But if you want to really deep dive into the condition, mm -hmm. yeah. then having the specific condition <clears throat> um, run groups is really important. Mm -hmm. And also, I think... For the specific conditions the support network that happens in a group um, and it might be the people themselves or the carers that entity doesn't happen in a, in a general singing for health um, yeah. group as well so i think there is a real benefit for being um, condition specific mm -hmm. um, but interesting i was just going to pick up what you said sophie about the breathing uh, we have similar kind of issues with Parkinson's that uh, people will overthink things. So we always say do breath by stealth yeah. mm -hmm. um, rather than a kind a of making a big thing of it. And probably for slightly different reasons. But if you suddenly start breathing in, it becomes a, a massive issue. So we, all of our exercises we call breathing by stealth. So mm -hmm. there's there's similarities, but the kind of nuances, aren't there? Yeah, stealth, stealth is one of the words that we used right at the very beginning when we were doing our training in 2017. And, you know, we have to try and be stealthy so that people don't overthink it. Having said all of that, though, we do have members who say to us, can you explain to us what, why we're doing yeah. that? For example, there's a an exercise called uh, hamster cheeks um, or puffy cheeks, um, which we do try and do at every session. And it's just a trumpet type idea. Um, and it's we do that because it sort of causes a, a, a vacuum, I suppose, in, in the chest cavity, which um, forces the... And if you try it yourself, you'll find, if you hold on to your core muscles, you'll feel them moving backwards when you when you do it. So that And that's why we do it, so that they could, they're actually using their core to, um, to get the breath out. And but that goes back to the importance of the training, doesn't yeah, it? Because it does. uh, it's similar, we kind of say to when we're training, you don't necessarily have to explain everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. But if a participant, and because everyone has different learning styles, and there will be participants who want to know the mm -hmm. ins and outs, and yeah. if you can't answer that, mm -hmm. then that's not effective kind that's of right. leadership. Because um, we have we have a, a we call it sirening um, mm. because it's it's a, it's a mm, mm. and we do that in every session because we're looking to increase the range of people's voices mm. with Parkinson's and most people just accept it but other people why are we doing that yeah. noise Nicola mm. and if you can't answer it mm -hmm. then that's that's where the training is really important sirening is important we do that as well yeah yeah. Excellent. Well, I mean, you're already touching on my very next question, which is uh, why is Singing for Health leader training so important? Uh, now, I know you touched on this already, but could you outline some of the other reasons why this training is essential? So we've kind of touched on the kind of the safety aspect and kind of knowledge aspect. But also, I think uh, both of us will say that the work is really effective, mm. actually quite low cost. I think, you know, if you think about one leader, maybe a hall or a, a venue and the amount of people you have in the room. So it's a really cost effective intervention. Um, but they, you know, I am I, very, I strongly believe that people should have the option to be able to go to one of these groups. But if we don't have the workforce who are trained and, and safe and knowledgeable, then we can't offer it to people. Um, so it's it's that you know, it's kind of you have to have the workforce in order to to, to promote the work. Um, so it's a little bit like the government at the moment, you know, they like everyone's going to have to do maths A level, which is a, which is genius. But who's going to teach them? Get that the thing. <laughs> who's going to teach all these children these, these maths A level? Let's not talk about the value of it, but um, just as in a practical thing. And that's kind of how I feel that if we want to promote this work, we have to have people doing it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think this country itself, you know, for, as a whole, uh, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, we have a huge diversity of um, um, different, different ethnic groups. We have diversity in terms of um, uh, income and uh, education. And the disease that we deal with, the COPD, but also uh, 
asthma and other respiratory diseases that COPD is predominantly to do with de deprivation and um, poorer um, social economic um, status. So you know, I think it's important that we that we target area, uh, different areas, and that's really the main problem with us at the moment is trying to target areas because Scotland is so um, spread out and the communities are so spread out, there's not so much in the way of great built up areas like there are in England. There's a lot of little pockets of rural rurality. And so actually getting people, and you quite often find that singing group leaders live in communities like that. So it's trying to get them to um, become interested in training for, for health, singing for health. So they can then bring their groups to more rural areas and to just spread the word right across the whole of the country. Um, and I think it's potentially, you, know, you might argue with me this on this, but I think it's potentially easier in a built-up area uh, to, to do that than it is in rural areas um, where there is often um, comorbidity in terms of disease. Um, so there are people living with all sorts of conditions with less access to general practitioners, less access to hospital, for example, and certainly less access to um, to this sort of intervention and, and you know, um, stuff, things that like pulmonary rehabilitation and, for example, or cardiac rehabilitation. Um, it, it, it's not as easy for those people. If you're living on an island and you've got to get a ferry and the ferries, well, that's a huge issue in Scotland at the moment. So, you know, it's... Um, it is a problem for people. So if we can find people to train them in those areas, then we're spreading the word to groups, to areas that really need it. Interesting, actually. In some ways, it's harder in the urban, the big kind of in London, particularly in the, some of the big urban um, centres, because there aren't the community spaces mm. to run these groups. Yeah. And also the transport, particularly in, like if you've got Parkinson's trying to get across London to come to a group can be really limiting. So actually sometimes they're more successful, uh, not necessarily right out in the country, but then I think sometimes in England right out in the country is slightly different to out mm -hmm. in the country in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so the the transport issue where people can drive to the to the centres themselves actually seems to make those groups more popular mm -hmm. than the urban ones. But I, I was also thinking when you said um, about uh, COPD being kind of a, a lower social economic demographic, mm -hmm. Parkinson's is the opposite. It, it's it's anybody. Yeah. So there's a there's a it kind of covers all bases. So they interesting just within the two conditions. Those mm -hmm. are those are different, which is why right. we sometimes need these different uh, groups in order to mm -hmm. to make sure we're covering all these bases, isn't mm -hmm. it? The, the chain gang groups are interesting. The demographic is mostly elderly. Um, and depending on where we are, we have people with COPD who tend to come from a lower socio-economic group. But then we have people with asthma and we have people with bronchiectasis, for example, and other lung diseases who come from across the board. So there's an interesting mix of demographics within, within the groups. Um, not that that's got anything to do with training, but it's just an interesting point. <laughs> 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 but, but I think our, our trainers should represent that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, I yes, think that's, yes. If you want to bring it back to training, I think yes, it's important no, to absolutely. represent that. Yeah, and that's that's a problem. I think um, you know, in Scotland, we don't have a huge. In, in cities, we do have a huge, or we have an interesting mix of um, different ethnicities, um, but less so in the rural areas. Um, but uh, in, the, in the big cities we do, and uh, it would be interesting to see if we had any interest in Glasgow, for example, which has got, um, this morning, when we were trying to find this place, I spoke to somebody from Eastern Europe, and I spoke to a very nice Kurdish man from Iran, <laughs> while I was trying to find the conservatoire. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there is a huge ethnic mix, and he was actually sitting outside a little place for refugees. Um when I, was, when I was chatting to him. So, yeah, it, it would be really nice, I think, if we could um, interest people from different ethnic groups to to do singing for uh, for health, you know, and, and particularly mental health, I think, for people who are refugees and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a, an interesting concept, I think. There's definitely lots of food for thought about why it's really important to to train people today in the workshop we were thinking about the skill sets 
um, that a singing for health leader might need. And these are really multifaceted skill sets, of course. Um, from your experience, what are these sort of key skill sets that you would want to see in a singing leader? And what training would they need to help develop these particular skill sets? Um, it's an interesting question because when people come on the training course, there is no baseline. Um, so some people will be musically very competent. Other people will have really great empathy. Um, uh, some people will be naturally charismatic. So within the training and the sharing and particularly getting people to kind of work together, you uh, what, what I hope that people will pick up on the points that they might be uh, not as natural at. But I think from my perspective, my really big role is to give people confidence because, yes, you can kind of tickle the, the skills and the knowledge and, and that's important so that people know about Parkinson's, know about the exercises that are suitable. Um, you know, you know we, we work to a kind of goals framework in the Sing to Beat model. But if they go away feeling that they can't do it and that they are unable to do it, uh, I feel that I, as a trainer, haven't done my job properly. And of course, confidence is interesting because some people will naturally be more confident than others. So those particularly people you can see are really able, but just are lacking in their own self ability. That's my job to bring that out. Of them. Yeah, the skill set's an interesting one. The first time we did any training um, for the train guy in 2017, we had something like 30 people who um, applied to do the course. And we ended up interviewing about 18 of those people and ended up with 10. Um, and this time when we ran the training, we decided not to interview anyone and we didn't take CVs. We just said, if you're interested, get in touch with us. Um, and it was it was an interesting difference, I think, because we knew very little. We asked them to fill in a little form, a little registration form this time to see what, what their experience was. So we had the first time it was it was Virtually all, I think you'll probably agree with me, Sophie, uh, singing group leaders, yeah, that we that we had. This time we had a lot of um, music therapists, for example. We had people who didn't have much experience in leading singing groups, but had um, respiratory conditions themselves. Uh, we had people who were, we had two doctors actually who work in Glasgow, um, and it's very interesting the work that they're doing. So it, it, it was very different this time. And um, to me, it was somehow um, it was it was really interesting to see how they uh, interacted, and to see how which members of the, the the group would eventually say yes, I want to do this. Um, and actually, on the day, I think I had decided it was interesting which which people would follow up and which wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it was a, it was an interesting thing. So as far as skill sets are concerned, I think I think that in one way I think it'd be a, a good way, just, a good thing to just ask people: Do you want to do this training? Come along and do it. And if you want to carry it on, then that's fine. And if you don't, then you there's no such thing as a waste of education. You're always going to learn something. You know, every day is a school day. So you know, I I don't think it's a waste to to do it that way. Um, but the first time, because we had a limited amount of money, we had to um, be a bit more cautious about what we were doing. But, you know, of 10 people that we trained, we got four people out of it. And this time, of the 16 people we trained, we got four people out of it. So I think it's really interesting because, similar to us, we don't uh, necessarily look... We, I think there's a very small form to get onto the training just so that you... just just to have a few kind of prompters, but we don't know very much. Um, and the same, we don't, we train a lot more people than people end up facilitating. But I agree with you on that point that you as the trainer will often know the person in the room mm -hmm. who is going to take take the ball and, and go and run with it. Yeah. Um, they don't necessarily know themselves at that point. So if you tell them, they'd probably be too scared. But but it's, it's an interesting, and I have never quite figured it out why what that is because you could have someone who can answer all the questions correctly and be you know just not have the right 
skill set um, but looks like they do they've got it on paper where then somebody else might not tick all the boxes but just has something about them that you know will be able to be in a room with people with a health condition and magic will happen mm-hmm. so and it's that's the one thing that I wish I could bottle that and then you could make more leaders but that's not how the world works yes because our first saying group leader the, the first one we had the, the chain gang was um i had been to a, a singing workshop in a little town in uh, the borders called peebles and there was this american woman took the took the the singing workshop this was before we thought about the chain gang and um God, she had me singing in latin and everything you know <laughs> and, and uh, she was just slightly off the wall but there was something about her that I thought, gosh, she's absolutely brilliant. And so when we thought about the chain gang, we, I said, let let me ask her. And so and she's still with us. And she, you know, no, with no knowledge of respiratory disease, um, she she came on board and you know we've sort of trained her as we've been going along. Um, so it, you know, I, I think. It, it's just knowing that, that the person is right in terms of their ability to run a group and to, to see within the group that the dynamic is right. I think that's really important mm-hmm. to be able to work as, as a group leader, to see that somebody's not struggling a little bit or you know she can, she can see, she can pick these things up. But also she, she um, picks really good songs that everybody likes and you know she, she has a, she sources songs all the time so that's what she loves doing and she writes songs herself as well so yeah I, th- I think that's uh, you just we were just lucky we've been really lucky that we've we've had all the, the same group leaders that we have but it is an ability to hold space isn't yes, it, in a certain way yeah. and and to actually write that down and say this is how you hold space mm-hmm. is because everyone has their individuality mm-hmm. And everyone does it in a slightly different way. I mean, I always uh, laugh that I think I'm a failed comedian. That's how I hold space. Um, uh, if I'd, you know, if I'd been better at jokes, I would have been on the circuit. But, um, but different. But someone else can have the most calm demeanour, and they will beautifully hold a space. Mm-hmm. So it's that ability, and that's something that I think is very difficult to train. Yeah. Nicola, it makes me think about the project we worked on over lockdown about mental health inclusive choirs. Um, so it was a project we did with uh, Ewan Irons. Yeah, David Sheffield. Yeah. Uh, Michael Bon. Bon, bon sure. Yeah. Uh, Lisbeth Tip. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there were loads of us. Um, but that project was about looking at inclusive practice. So specifically thinking about mental health, um, but also really just how you facilitate a safe space, which is important for any choir or singing group. Um, and we really delved into what are these key qualities that uh, a singing leader should have when facilitating that space, going right into the research, doing focus groups, literature reviews, um, and trying to build a toolkit to inform people about how to how to do that. But I still think even with all that, there, there are some people that walk in the room and you just know they can do it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, someone I work with a lot, she came on my training course and I, she walked in the room and I was like, I know that I can, so we st- I know that you can lead, I just can tell. And so we started doing a project before I'd even seen her lead, which looking back, I think, oh, that was a bit of a risk. <laughs> um, but actually, I, you just get a sense of someone. And uh, you, and I think that's, that's the really, you, you, that's the interesting thing about it is nailing that down and uh but some people just have it in the same way that you know some people are really good at public speaking you know you can teach someone to public speak but someone will always be naturally better at it i think well i think knowing your subject is really important so you know if you're going to be taking a a a group for singing for health no matter what it is then you need to know that the people that you're working with will have limitations and you have to know the type of songs you should be singing for, you know, and just sourcing good material that people aren't going to find too daunting. You know, there, nobody wants to be trying to sing a choral piece when, when they're when they've got COPD. So, um, yeah. So I think it's it's just knowing knowing your audience and being confident about about your ability as a singing group leader. I think that's the. And it's also. 
Um, Because I I learned this lesson quite early on that the swallow mechanism Mm -hmm. uh, for people with Parkinson's uh, is uh, obviously one of the other reasons that we really exercise the larynx because once that's weakened, then that brings up a lot more health problems. Um, And I I trained someone and then she went into a Parkinson's group and told the people with Parkinson's that this is probably the thing that we have to do because it's likely to be the thing that's going to be the cause of death. And and I hadn't thought not, I had not thought not to tell her not to do that. Mm. And so now, obviously, I'll go, there are points that you don't need to say, but I I didn't think I would, needed to, if that Mm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you suddenly realise, yeah, actually, there are some kind of... uh, some things that you n- will naturally think about that other people won't naturally think about. Mm-hmm. And so that's also a responsibility. Yeah, and that's interesting because we always mention the fact that you're going to be working with pe- a group of people who have chronic disease and you will lose people. And, and you know, you become friends with these people. Mm-hmm. You love some of them and and they will pass away. And... Um, you know, so it's it's a really difficult thing because a lot of our singing group leaders are quite young. You know, Sophie being a bairn herself. <laughs> and, you know, so it, it is a an interesting concept, and I think it's a steep learning curve for for younger people that to understand that these people that they're working with will probably at some point die of the condition that they're suffering from. I think you managed that so sensitively in the training that I did when you talked about, I don't know, this as something that you'll experience in your group. Mm -hmm. And I really took a lot away from that training and thinking about it. But of course, when someone, the first person from my group did die and I went to their funeral and I was a wreck, (laughs) it was really hard. Um, You can't train someone to be prepared for that. But I think you managed the topic so sensitively in the training that it left an impression on me. And I found that particularly, uh, you know, I was very aware of that. But after the pandemic, it was very aware when we went back back into person because some of my groups didn't work so well online, or people weren't able to access online, and suddenly there were just gaps. Mm. And, and and a couple of years later, people, you know, it's always a moving feast. But it was really kind of stark when you're like, oh, I haven't heard from. Oh. Mm. Oh. and you suddenly realise well, you're probably not going to hear from them again or, or you have had news of them as well so I think that was quite a confronting it felt it felt like it all came at once rather than yeah. one, at, yeah, one at a time um, so I think yeah I think you're right it's a really it's a it's a it's it's it's, it's the people's reality and so we have to be very sensitive yeah. to that as much as it's painful for us it's their, it's their reality yeah. it's an, and again that's an interesting point about um whether you contact them or not. And one of the things that we, um, as a chain gang that we have with our groups is we have an admin person for each group and they are the only person who has the contact details for um, the members of the group and they will keep in touch with them either by WhatsApp groups or by email or whatever. And if somebody doesn't turn up, then they will contact them and say, do you still want to remain on my mailing list or are you okay? Is there anything I can do? That sort of thing. And I think if we're training people to take singing groups, One of the discussions I had this morning with one of the people who was here was about the fact that he spends so much of his time um, applying for funding. (laughs) And he's a singing group leader and he he wants to just do the music. But, you know, there's a lot of time being taken up by applying for funding. So actually having a group where you have somebody who's working as an administrator or having a committee where somebody is willing to help to take on some of that work um, is, is no bad thing. Yeah, no, I agree because I, I spend a lot of my time writing funding applications um, because I don't just work in Parkinson's, but I work in uh, mental health. Mm-hmm. And although we have a committee, they've all got lived in mental health experience. Mm-hmm. So the stress of writing a funding application is, is sometimes too much. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then you end up thinking, sometimes I'll turn up to rehearsal and I'm, not, I'm quite good at sight reading so I can get away with it but sometimes I think I haven't looked at this piece of music and I'm going to deliver it I, I normally but I would like to be more prepared but I've spent some time investing in, in the funding to keep the group going so and ultimately my skill set is doing the music and so um, yeah that is and that reality sometimes for leaders 
I, I sometimes don't always tell them that reality at the training because you want to get them involved and slightly hooked before you go, actually, you won't. But but also I think the the model that we do, we, we do this work slightly on the cheap, I would say, because mm. we should be paid more because we yeah. are spending so much more time doing other things. Yeah. But trying to convince a funder that when they say, we just do it for an hour, mm. is it's a, it's a tricky model. Well, that actually brings me on to our very next question. So as part of this project, Sophie and I have been mapping the various training in Singing for Health available throughout the UK. And so far, it feels like a little bit of a minefield. And um, there's been quite a lot of different training that can focus on supporting people with different health conditions, as you've both spoken about. There's more holistic training that takes a much more broad spec approach. And um, there's quite a lot of training in certain areas of England, some in the central belt, um, including a uh, training run by the chain gang. But we also noticed that there's some fantastic training that no longer runs. Um, so what are the challenges in developing and sustaining training for Singing for Health leaders in the UK? I mean, I've kind of mentioned it already in, in a slightly different way, but cost, mm. because le uh, leaders aren't paid that much often it's done on a shoestring and then if you want them to pay for good quality training then that costs money that is often far more than they might get paid in a month and so the two things don't quite match and so uh sing to be we're lucky we're, we're subsidized because we've got a, a, a currently um a, a funder that's supporting it but that's not necessarily the same for everyone all of the organizations um so i think that is a huge a huge problem mm. i would agree with that i think cost is a um it's the, it's the big problem however i would also say that um things like for example and again in scotland because of the um, spread of the population um doing a face-to-face -face session can be a problem for people who live on the islands for example um or in highlands and so our idea would be that we would take our training to them because it, our training, I believe, is you can't do it all online because it's very hands on. And, um, you know, Gillian, who does our training with us, um, she will quite often, with the person's permission, come up and just pop her hand on your tummy when you're, when you're singing and sort of push your back out a wee bit and <laughs> um, change your posture. Uh, while, you're, while you're in training so that sort of thing and if she doesn't actually put her hands on you she'll come and stand beside you and tell you so she needs to be able to see uh, what you're doing um, so I think the travel aspect of it can be a real problem for people because it's expensive and um, and, it, and again it just comes down to money and online training uh, well I just think that people switch off on online training often I'm not a huge fan of Zoom meetings um, you know, I'm really not. I, I, I much prefer being in the company of people and seeing the whites of their eyes <laughs> when, I'm, uh, when we're doing a bit of training. I think um, I find online training. I can never tell whether uh, whether people are engaged or not uh, on in online training. You know, you quite often see cats driving across, <laughs> across the front of the screen. You see people sort of sitting with their bacon roll and their coffee, and and you think to yourself, well, you know. Are you actually listening to what I'm saying? <laughs> and just it's it's hard to tell sometimes. And then other people just switch their camera off. You don't even know if they're there. No, that is that is true. Mm -hmm. But but I often um uh we do do online training, but we also do mm -hmm. um, offline training as well. So we do a kind of a dual yeah. model. Yeah, so but the online training we don't do in long chunks. Mm -hmm. So we do small like modules rather mm -hmm. than a whole day because I think mm -hmm. if you spend too long you're right, people turn off. Yeah. But I'm also quite sneaky. I, I make sure that they're I, I, I'm it's very interactive. So every kind of twenty minutes I propose a question and someone has to answer it. So you can't not just you can't yeah, not so be involved. But uh, so did we. But you, can, you still always know the people that are going to answer. You can tell just by looking at the screen who's going to who's going to engage and who isn't. You know, and it's a bit like when you walk into a room, you can tell as well yeah. if you're if you know your subject, I suppose. There are some people who just like training courses, though. Yes, <laughs> yes, there are, and there are some people who like online training courses and don't particularly like the face-to-face -face sessions, which is interesting. So um, that's why we included a face-to-face -face element in it. 
Thank you both for the thoughts on that. I mean, I know that the online training element is a bit divisive. There, mm. there are those that, for accessibility reasons, mm. they prefer the online um, mm. models. It enables them to do things that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, while there are those who far prefer the in-person finding the online quite inaccessible. Mm. Um, and it's it's something that in this new post-pandemic world that I think we're all <laughs> navigating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, the other topic that we touched on today uh, was accredited training. And I know, Anne, you've got a little bit of experience, Nicola, you too, of trying to develop accredited training. So how do you feel about that? And what I mean by accredited training for any listeners who might be uh, wondering what that means is that accredited training is usually recognised by an awarding body such as the SQA or the QAA. So how do you feel about accredited training for singing for health leaders? I have real reservations about it, only because we've had so many problems. Um, not so much problems, but we, we looked into it and it just there seemed to be barriers all the time. The main barrier was cost. It was going to be a really expensive thing. And then, you know, we've asked people, would it be more valuable to you to do a course that's accredited? And most of them said, no, not particularly. They just wanted to have the training. Um, so we, in the end, we decided not to, to accredit it. Um, but we did offer a certificate. But, you know, it wasn't a... It was just a certificate. It was just a bit of paper, really. Um can I, can I ask, just before you go on, mm. why were you considering accredited training? Ah, now that's because as a nurse, as a retired nurse, um, thank God, um, <laughs> I if I was doing training, then I wanted to be accredited because it would add to my continuing professional development. And that's when I just assumed that everybody who's um, got any sort of profession would want to be accredited, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, and because we're all nurses... Um, and, and, you know, there's teachers on board as well. Um, we all just thought, right, maybe we should look at accreditation. And then when I started asking saying group leaders, are you interested in accreditation? The majority of them said no. Exactly the same mm. uh, with the Sync to Beats. So the last kind of couple of years, I think we came to the conclusion about last summer, but the good 18 months before uh, we were looking at different yeah. accrediting, <laughs> accrediting bodies. And yes, cost was, uh, you know, you, that cost uh, would be a lot and that would have to be passed on to the participant. And we're already trying to keep the cost down already. But also, what what actually were we trying to accredit as such? As in, is it, you know, is it them justifying that they've learnt the knowledge about Parkinson's, how to write a risk assessment? Or... How do you know? How do you actually accredit what happens in the room in a group when people are working really, really well? And that's what we couldn't ever quite come up with the the way of uh, kind of judging that, I suppose, because what is who judges that? You know, we have kind of uh, we, I can identify a good practitioner, but then if I started judging people on that, that's that's a whole different different ball game, and we never. I felt that was right and some of the accrediting boards you know were because often it comes you know we're sitting in in a in an institution at the moment but will come from those kind of bodies and and often it's it might be an essay or something quite academic and and I think that will um for some of the leaders who are really special in the room that's not their forte so I was feeling that we were excluding people and no one's ever asked for it yet Mm -hmm. Now that could be coming down the line, but I'm just not sure if, if uh, us as specialists, I think us being absorbed into something else is different than us in the specialist having to find that extra kind of uh, cost. Mm-hmm. I think I think there's a I think there's possibly a different model, but I don't think we should be responsible for it at the moment. Yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, what we did do this time after our training was we had a, in discussions with Chest Heart Stroke Scotland. I suggested that perhaps we could ask the people who'd done the training if they would like to give us some reflection on um, how they were, how they found working with people with um, respiratory conditions, for example. Um, and we've had a couple of written pieces, 
Um, um, and I said, you can either do it as a video, you don't have to do it, but you can do it as a video, you could write it, you could write a song if you want, you could write a poem, you can do whatever you like, just to reflect how, how you've... Um, how you found working with people with respiratory conditions. And we've, we've had a couple of written pieces and we've had one particularly good video, um, which was, she called it War and Peace. <laughs> it was quite lengthy, but um, and what we're going to do as an organisation as Ching is we're going to edit that video and put out little bite-sized comments. And I think Chester and Stroke will use those as well to advertise for the next course. But I think, and again, this comes back to my nursing experience, Reflection is a hugely important part of yeah. working with people who have got long-term conditions. And reflecting on your work with these people, I think, is vital. Um, and I would encourage anybody who is going to be working with people who have got long-term conditions that they do reflect on their work, no matter what their role is. Actually, that comes back to another skill of knowing how mm -hmm. to appropriately reflect and, yes. mm -hmm. and utilising those reflective mm -hmm. practice skills mm -hmm that maybe someone thinking that they want to move into this field don't realise that mm -hmm. they might need. Yes, exactly. And I think I touched on the fact that we'd been working with students from the engineering department at Edinburgh University. And uh, one part of the, their module was to write a, to work with a reflective diary. And they were engineers. They had no idea what reflection was, you know, at, at the beginning. And now I think they really value the whole notion of reflection. Certainly the students that we had last year have had all commented on that, how reflection was an interesting and um, valuable tool to use for part of their, for their course. Um, so I think that reflection is underrated. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, it's actually a very, um, it's quite scary um, because you really have to look to yourself and your practice and then, um, but, um, I think it's very useful. It almost feels like there should be some uh, way of moderating a reflective mm. diary over mm. a year mm. and, yeah. Yeah. and showing how people have developed. Because mm. also, I don't believe that anyone gets this work right all the time. No, no, we all true. have moments where we don't yeah. say the right thing mm. or, or there's a situation that we don't quite know how to handle. And it's you're right, that's when the reflection is really important. Mm. But if you were being judged at that moment, that's a really that doesn't reflect on your entire practice. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, I think there are possible different ways of approaching how to uh, kind of kind of call yourself a sing to beat practitioner or mm -hmm. a, mm -hmm. a lung health practitioner. I mean, I know once people have been on large training that they do find it quite useful in their CVs to say that they've been on the course and they've they've mm -hmm. also got a certificate. But again, no one's necessarily asking for accreditation. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. No, and Nicola, and I totally get what you're saying about people <coughs> maybe feeling like, like, oh, I don't want to do the academic side, that's not me, and it would be really off-putting. But then there is this whole other side of the job where it's, you could be spending much of your time doing funding applications and actually research skills like being able to evaluate your group, being able to do surveys, knowing the right questions to ask. All of that kind of quote unquote academic skill mm -hmm. is actually crucial to ensuring that your group just continues to run on a day to day basis. Yeah, I, I agree, actually. I think you're right in that in that. But what slightly concerns me was is trying to disseminate practice into something academic. And I think that, and we found that when we did our research project yeah. on the mental health inclusive choir, it's a kind of, and, and when I, um, I've been lucky enough to write a co-author a book with Dr. Trish Bella Burroughs on singing to be Parkinson's practice. It's the hardest thing to actually write down what you do and why it works. Yeah, I would agree with that. So I think that's, it's not necessary. I agree. You do have to have kind of some written skills, or I mean, a lot of funding now. In, in the, I work a lot in the borough of Southwark in London, and actually, lots of funding that you can do in videos now, which is actually really they're trying to change the funding model away from endless pages. So whoever's in in the in there at the moment is doing a really great job, I think, because it's making it a lot more accessible for practitioners. But um, uh, I think it's just my worry of kind of making them the model academic and then that doesn't mean I don't agree with the mm. academic side it's it's and there are plenty of research practitioners you know Sophie is, is, is she's what she's definitely one uh, really great example but I think they are slightly it's just there's something about it that doesn't quite work for me 
Yeah, I think I think Sophie's um, probably the exception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think because most of the people who've applied to do our training are not from academic backgrounds um, and are different age ranges. Um, so yeah, I th- I th- you know, again going back to nursing, I think I used to teach a course um, for Queen Margaret University about COPD, and that was a modular course and people had to write a, an essay at the end of it all and I guess um, it, that really determined whether somebody was going to come on the course or not and we had nurses who were very competent but just didn't want to do that and so they didn't come on the course but they came to every other thing that I did that wasn't accredited or wasn't part of the mm-hmm. Very interesting mm. Okay, well I want to say thank you to you both for speaking with us today. Um, We're going to be working to develop training for Singing for Health leaders throughout the next few months, so it's really useful and exciting to get both of your insights, as well as hearing from all of the practitioners that attended today as well. Before we finish our discussion today, is there anything that you would like to tell our listeners that we haven't covered? No, no. no. Um, <laughs> I, I was just going to say uh, it's been a really wonderful morning. Yeah, it has. Um, it's really exciting discussions, um, and uh, and I think the more it's really hard to always have these discussions because of work and and other commitments. But I think it's really great to. Um, discuss, me, me and Anna are a little bit older than you two, but it's really great to kind of see two younger people really taking this work and moving Absolutely. it forward. And uh, because that's something that always worries me that, that mm-hmm. sometimes the workforce is, is, isn't is always being accepted by the younger people. So I, I think there's something really exciting in the kind of uh, your energy and your drive and um, moving it forward. Definitely. Succession training. That, yes. That's, yes. That's what we do. <laughs> That's, that's very important that we, that we have successors and I'm heartened to see you two here today. Yeah. Well, we hope that whatever that we develop uh, is going to be um, developing people in all capacities, all stages, uh, so that they feel confident to be able to go and really take Singing for Health forward because I think we've all established it's a vital and important area that really does need to be recognised for the excellent work that's being done. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Next week, we are joined by Jill Miller, coordinator of the Trad Arts Mentoring Programme for Traditional Arts and Culture Scotland and a professional mentor with the Scottish Mentoring Network. We are also joined by Anne Gallagher, director of Luminate, Scotland's creative ageing charity. And they will together be recapping what we have discussed at our workshop on Building Singing for Health Training and Peer Support, which takes place on the 18th of June. We are excited to hear their thoughts on Singing for Health Training and also the importance of peer-to-peer support and mentoring. This podcast episode is produced by Scotland's Singing for Health Network, a project hosted at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland and funded by the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland's Innovation Studio. For more information on our activities, please visit our website. Our details are in the show notes.